where else did Kathy? There we go. Okay. Shall I start? Do you want to welcome everyone? Hello and welcome uh, to the Manchester Historic Association presentation of the Great Strike of 1922. My name is Kathy Howey and I'm a volunteer at AARP. Uh, please bear with me. We have a lot to go through before we get to the presentation uh, from AARP. Uh, but please note that today's presentation is being recorded. AARP has been promoting the health and well being of older Americans for over 60 years. Here in New Hampshire, AARP staff and volunteers work together to help make our community a friendly, livable place to work, place, play, and explore for age, people of all ages. And that we work closely with our community stakeholders to make our community an even better place to live. Additionally, we strive to bring you information, innovation, and fun virtual events like today's presentation as a means of connection and inclusion. Um, before we get started, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. To eliminate any background noise, please make sure you meet, mute excuse me, your microphone. Uh, your microphone mute is on your bottom left side of your uh, screen if you're on a laptop or a computer. You are on mute if your microphone has a line through it. So please make sure you do that so we eliminate background noise. You are welcome to appear on or off camera, but again, we are recording today's presentation. So if you do not want your video camera on, just click on the video camera icon, which is also at the bottom left hand of your, of your screen to make sure that it has a line through it. <clears throat> We'd love to hear from all of you today. So please use the chat box, which is actually at the bottom of your screen, uh, which can be accessed by clicking the chat button and type your question or comments where it says type message here. Our staff liaison, Bev Cotton, will be monitoring the chat and raising your questions and comments either throughout the program or at the end. Uh, finally, we encourage you to rename yourself so we can recognize you in the chat. So to do this, move your cursor on the upper right corner of your own image. <clears throat> so you look at your picture on the top of your picture, there's three dots. You click on that three dots and it clicks to rename and you can put your first name in there, which is just fine. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat uh, around uh, how to do the Zoom. Or we can help you with anything that comes up. Also, AERP has this new thing called the Job Search Resources, which uh, Mary just put the screen up for. Given today's presentation, we want to quickly share a bit of information on the AARP's job search resources. If you are looking for a job and you want to know what recruiters are really thinking, check out our AARP Job Seeker webpage. AARP works with employers to promote the value of 50 plus workers and connect them directly to you. We will put a chat, uh, excuse me, a link in the chat uh, for getting connected to these resources. Uh, for those who are looking for employment, be sure to visit the AARP Job Board, which helps match your years of valuable experience with employers that are committed to an diverse workforce. We will put a link in the chat for that as well. And finally, a solid resume means all the difference when applying for jobs. Get noticed by employers and bypass the hiring process ageism with a few changes to your resume. We hope you enjoy learning all these valuable resources by connecting to our AARP job resources page. And let's move on to today's program. Um, so today's presenter, pre presenter really doesn't likely need much introduction for most of you, uh, but in case you don't know him, uh, John Clayton is the executive director of the Manchester Hicks Historic Association <clears throat> and the Milliard Museum located in uh, downtown Manchester, in the Milliard area. He has spent 25 years as a reporter and columnist for the New Hampshire Union Leader and the author of seven books about Manchester and New Hampshire. 
Mr. Clayton's in the city column was a fixture on the front page of the union leader for more than 20 years and won very numerous awards, including best local column from the New England Associated Press news executives and best local author from the readers of New Hampshire Magazine. Mr. Clayton received an Emmy for his work with New Hampshire Public Television, where he is a longtime host of the New Hampshire Crossroads, and he is also honored by the New Hampshire Humanities Council as one of the state's 40 over 40 cultural icons. And he is a longtime resident of Manchester, New Hampshire, as I am. So take it away, John. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> it is great to be with you. I'm gonna start with something very stark. Uh, on Thursday, February 2nd, 1922, the following bulletin was posted in the different departments of the Amiskate Manufacturing Company. Notice, commencing Monday, February 13, 1922, a reduction of 20% will be made in all hour and place rates in all departments of the Amiskate. At the same time, the running time of the mills will be increased from 48 to 54 hours per week in accordance with the schedule posted herewith. That notice was signed by William P. Straw, who is the agent. Agent is the term they use for the CEO of Amiskate. And that was a real thunderclap uh, in the city of Manchester, uh, which had been known for almost a century as a strikeless city. Uh, that notice uh, prompted the 17,000 workers at Amoscape Manufacturing uh, to walk off the job. I'll give away the ending and tell you the strike lasted for 19, uh, nine months, pardon me, in a time when more than $50 million in wages and salaries and sales of Amoscape goods were lost. But I can't begin the story at the end. I have to go back to the beginning to put this all in some context. Um, the Amoscade Manufacturing Company was founded by a group of wealthy Boston businessmen, in fact, known as the Boston Associates in 1831. Their intent was to create an industrial utopia in which people would want to live and work. They bought 15,000 acres of land at what was pristine farmland in the community then known as Dairyfield, we know today as Manchester. The 15,000 acres of land they bought, this pristine farmland, uh, straddled both sides of the Merrimack River. Those 15,000 acres were zoned for industry and the rest of the surrounding property was to develop um, housing for those employees who would come to live and work here. The notion of an industrial utopia uh, was really based upon what these investors had seen uh, in other industrial countries like Great Britain, for example, that was their prime uh, illustration of what they wanted Manchester not to be. Uh, in particular, the cities of Manchester and Newcastle and Liverpool uh, had really become places of squalor because of their industrial development. Uh, there was pollution, there was overcrowding, there was substandard housing, and they just felt that that was not the standard that they wanted to adhere to. Uh, their previous mill experience had been in Lowell and Lawrence and Fall River, Mass, um, but that was really piecemeal uh, in terms of putting mill buildings into an existing community. In the case of Dairyfield or Manchester, uh, they were given the opportunity to have a clean slate from which to begin. They hired a 19-year-old engineer named Ezekiel Straw, who uh, was the grandfather of William Straw, who issued that edict with which I opened the program. <clears throat> Ezekiel Straw was an engineer and his task was to lay out the city of Manchester. Again, given that blank slate, uh, he laid out the roads and the streets uh, in a perfect grid in most cases. Um, some of the older neighborhoods in Manchester had been settled like Janesville off of Bridge Street, uh, which retained the cow path like streets. But for the most part, Ezekiel Straw used a ruler and uh, created this perfect grid, uh, naming the streets uh, not, not with numbers as they did in New York City uh, with West 53rd and East 22nd Street. Uh, he chose to name the streets after trees because it sounded more welcoming. So next time you're on the east side of the river, consider uh, Elm Street, uh, Chestnut, Pine, Beach, Maple, and I could go on and on, but I think you know those streets. Uh, and again, it was just an effort by Amoskeg to try to present a welcoming face to the workers who they would try to bring to come and work in this community. So if their mission is to build an industrial utopia, <clears throat> it has to start with a single mill. And so in, by 1840, that first mill was up and running. And what Amoscape discovered was that the mill uh, had taken in all of the local residents. They were all working at the mill. 
And how are you going to build another and another and another without finding a way to bring workers to the community? In the beginning, Amoskeg benefited from the famine in Ireland because unskilled Irish laborers were flooding uh, to America to escape the hunger and to find jobs and a safe place to raise their family. So it was those first Irish immigrants who were driven here by circumstance, uh, who dug the canals that would power the mills that they were going to build, uh, who carved the granite to form the foundations and laid the bricks to form the mills themselves. But now after that first mill is up and running, Amoskeg is going to need um, to develop what today we call workforce development. They were pioneers in the concept in the United States in that they had to go and find workers to bring them here. We're kind of in a similar circumstance today, which is why we have the Stay Work Play organization, which is designed to either encourage uh, New Hampshire residents to stay here uh, and make their living and their livelihoods here, and also to encourage others to come from away, as we say. So as this was happening um, in the Canadian maritime provinces, uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Quebec, uh, there was a blight taking place that was not unlike the blight that was affecting Ireland. Uh, family farms were uh, losing crops left and right. And if you went three years without a saleable crop, uh, you would lose your farm, your land to the Canadian government for simply being unable to pay your taxes. Amoskeg recognized this phenomenon was taking place. So they started sending agents by train to Montreal and Quebec City. And these agents would fan out through the countryside by horse and buggy, uh, towns like Chicoutimi and Trois-Rivières, and they would look for the foreclosure signs. And when they saw those signs, they quite simply would pull up to the house and knock on the door and speak to the residents and ask them if they would be interested uh, in coming to Manchester to um, live uh, and work under the auspices of Amoskeg. Uh, they had very few other options. There was no manufacturing in those farm countries, uh, farm counties in Canada. So oftentimes uh, they would take advantage of the opportunity which is why Manchester had such a mass migration of French Canadian workers uh, coming into the city from, let's say, um, 1840 through the 1880s. And this um, really helped shape the complexion of Manchester in terms of the ethnic diversity that we know today. But it was really based upon the Amistad need for workforce development as much as it was for social development. But having said that, Amistad um, worked under a, a premise uh, that we call corporate paternalism. Uh, they treated their employees like children, and I don't mean that in a denigrating way. I mean, they looked out for their welfare. Uh, in his creation of the city, for example, Ezekiel Straw made certain to set aside land for parks and playgrounds and churches and schools because they wanted to encourage an active and vigorous lifestyle both in and out of the workplace. Why? A healthy worker is a happy worker, and conversely, a happy worker could be a healthy worker as well. So they were very mindful of the need to develop this kind of um, culture amongst their employees. It went so far as in 1911, and I'm kind of skipping ahead here, um, they created what really became known as the first health healthcare plan for Amoskeg employees. And it wasn't just the emergency rooms that they maintained in the mill yard in the event of industrial accidents. They actually uh, went forward into what we would call today preventive care. Uh, they had checkups for the employees, they had classes on how to prepare nutritious meals. And again, we mentioned the playgrounds and the schools. The company actually built um, Gill Stadium uh, in 1913, then known as Textile Field, uh, as a means for recreation and opportunity to keep the employees happy. Uh, it wasn't just good wages. They felt it was a lifestyle that would have made Amoskeg a success. And I should point out, in case you don't know, Amoskeg is an unusual word, uh, and it's a Native American word that was applied to a portion of the Merrimack River, uh, a 50 foot waterfall that was known as the Amoskeg Falls. The native people would gather there more than 11,000 years ago uh, to harvest the bounty of the river. And the word Amoskeg means place of many fish. It was such a traditionally used word around here that when they created the company in 1831, they simply adopted that as the name of the company. So I'm sure uh, they had a lot of explaining to do to uh, the garment workers and the, and the textile manufacturers who would purchase their products as to the meaning of Amoskeg. But here in Manchester, we do celebrate that. So the immigration uh, piece is still important, even though we're going to talk about a labor strike, because language barriers um, served to help make Manchester a strikeless city. Uh, when Amoskeg basically met its need for numbers of employees, their recruitment and workforce development became more about specific skill sets. 
for example, in Great Britain, uh, their textile industry was much more advanced than ours. So Amoskeg would send workers to uh, Scotland and Ireland to recruit dyers uh, who could dye fabrics. And they would come here with their handwritten recipes uh, to make just the right shade of pink or green. Uh, the Swedes were also um, excellent weavers and lace makers, um, as were the Belgians. So Manchester is suddenly developing a burgeoning community of both Swedish and Belgian uh, workers who came here to work for Amoskeg. The language barrier becomes more pronounced when Amoskeg's uh, foundry, its business, uh, its manufacturing office um, began to expand. They realized that given the intricacies and tech technologies around textile manufacturing, that having machinists and engineers who could build and repair these machines uh, was paramount rather than depending on a subcontractor. They wanted to have people in house who could take care of these things. So the best engineers and machinists in the world at that time were in Germany. So Amoskeg's recruiters started heading to Germany to bring uh, those engineers and machinists to come and live in Manchester. And now many people think of the west side of Manchester as kind of a monolithic French Canadian community. It was really the northwest part of Manchester where they settled um, on the streets that were named to attract them. Streets like Notre Dame Avenue, Cartier, Dubuque, Alsace, Laval. Uh, so they were in the northwestern part of Manchester. The German community uh, really settled largely around what we call Granite Square. And uh, they brought with them their manufacturers. So uh, Scotlands and Weiglers, who were the sausage makers who came with their German brethren, uh, beer makers. It was a really thriving Germanic community. But what you see emerging here now from all these different ethnicities is a multitude of languages being spoken in the mill yard. Part of the reason Manchester was considered a strikeless city is because of that language barrier that would prevent workers from unifying around the notion of a textile union. Another difference was that here in Manchester, the workers were represented by a rather tame labor union, um, the, I'm going to blank, uh, the United Textile Workers of America. And that was really different than what was happening to the South where communities like Lowell and Lawrence had very different union representation. Um, the international workers of the world were the prevailing textile union there. Uh, they were known as the Wobblies. And during the time of the Soviet revolution, uh, the Bolshevik movement, uh, they were very, considered to be very radical. They had different ideas about what labor meant, what it meant to be a worker. And they used worker with a capital W, as you probably recall. So there were violent riots in Lowell and Lawrence um, spurred on by the Wobblies as they were known. And yet here in Manchester, we had a more docile union with the United Textile Workers. So it just um, really set the stage for a kind of a placid um, kumbaya environment where everybody got along. And uh, the workers felt that Amoskeg had their best interests at heart. Uh, they liked the benefits. They liked the amenities, again, that, of living in a beautiful uh, green city. And that helped kept the notion of a strike um, in abeyance for years and years and years. But then it becomes about economics. Um, look at the date, 1922, and recognize that um, Amoskeg uh, was touched by world events in many, many ways. So for instance, as we go into the very prosperous uh, 1900s, uh, by 1914, um, the Great War has begun in Europe. And orders for material are flooding in from Canada and Great Britain to produce textiles to make uniforms for their soldiers. In fact, Manchester's shoe industry was beginning to burgeon at that time. And W.H. Uh, McKelwin uh, got a contract at one point for 18,000 pairs of boots for the Russian army. So Manchester is suddenly getting an influx of cash that might be artificially inflating uh, what really was happening in the months leading up to that, particularly the case with Amoskeg. By 1916, when America entered the war, uh, Amoskeg was flush with federal grant money to create material for uniforms for soldiers. In fact, uh, one Amoskeg branch, uh, the Chicopee Mill, was manufacturing gauze uh, by miles and miles of gauze to be used as bandages uh, for treating wounded soldiers overseas. So the community was really flush with cash. And then the war ended. All that money goes away. At the same time this was transpiring, uh, the ability to burn coal to generate power um, was something that Amoskeg adopted. Uh, they had depended for years and years on the power of the Merrimack River to power their mills. But then when the notion of steam power came along, they adopted it. So did mills in the American South. And that was a game changer for Amoskeg because they were able to produce the finest textiles in the world. Uh, we have 
medals and ribbons all throughout the Milliard Museum testi testifying to their uh, quality of their work. But when the Southern competition came in, consider the Amoskeg business model. It was based upon bringing cotton here from the American South. And when we do our field trips with young people, we make no bones about it. Uh, they know that that cotton was being harvested by enslaved people. Uh, and it was simply the business model Amoskeg had adopted at the time. But by the time of the Civil War, 1860, um, things are shifting rapidly in the American South. Uh, Amoskeg continued to use um, cotton from the textile mills in the South, I'm uh, pardon me, the cotton fields in the South, but those Southern manufacturers decided if we build our, our wooden mills here, they're less expensive to operate. We don't need the water power anymore. The water and the, the rivers in the South were slow and meandering uh, versus the powerful rivers in the Northeast that were powered by snow and um, rain, rain. So they started building mills in the South. There was no labor operations uh, operating in the Southern textile mills. So workers were paid very low wages and produced substandard products. But there was a subtle shift in the American mindset about the quality of materials. So they started uh, buying inferior products, willing to pay less for, um, again, less quality products. So Amoskeg's business model is slowly turning against them. They need to find ways to uh, counter the flow of money that's going to the South and not coming here. So that is when Mr. Straw in 1922 um, posted the notice that your work week that was 48 hours is now 54 hours and we're cutting your pay 20% at the same time. So what happens? These formerly strikeless city um, suddenly looks up and says, we're not gonna take this. Uh, the union representation called for a vote amongst the workers and the tally is astounding. I did mention they had 17,000 employees, uh, but only 12,150 chose to vote on the question of whether to go out on strike. The results, however, to reject the, the cut in wages, 12,032 votes against 118. I'm not a politician, but I would call that a landslide. And thus, thus uh, Amoskeg, that was, the cut was scheduled to go into place on February 13. Uh, that is the day that uh, Amoskeg shut down. They tried to open their mills, uh, but no one showed up. And pickets marched in columns uh, around all of the openings to the mill. This image you're looking at here um, is from a bitterly cold day, February 13, 1922. These workers are marching outside the Amoskeg Employment Office, which was on Canal Street. And if you're a sharp observer and you look to the upper portion of the photograph, uh, you'll actually see the upper canal. Uh, canal Street, many people think was the canal, but actually it was so named because it ran parallel to the canal. So this is a show of force by workers on that fourth day in spite of the conditions. Um, and then Amoskeg announced that the mills are now closed until further notice. This is the beginning of a nine month ordeal, not just for Amoskeg, but for the people of the city. Because with 17,000 employees in a city of about 40,000 people at that time, um, if you didn't work at Amoskeg, your job depended upon those who did work at Amoskeg. If you ran a dress shop, for example, uh, no one was coming in to buy dresses because they were not working. If you ran a butcher shop, you were selling a lot more hamburger than steak because the workers were simply uh, rationing their money and trying to make it last for a strike of no known duration. The police chief of Manchester, Michael Healy, uh, was firmly on the side of Amoskeg throughout this. So demonstrations like this picketing line you're seeing here um, were often discouraged. Could we go to the next image? So workers had to discover their own language, ways to talk to one another and ways to talk to people who didn't understand what the strike was all about. So the phrase eight hours, as this slide indicates, um, became a simple vernacular thing. Eight hours per day is what they wanted as opposed to uh, the 10 or 12 hour day. And so when they would walk to one another, they would say eight hours and kids took it up as a rallying cry. It was just you know part of the mission uh, to keep the workers united. And those demonstrations, uh, although they were discouraged, still continued to take place. Can I see the next slide? This is an example of one of the demonstrations. If you're familiar with the west side of Manchester, you may recognize this as being uh, at the corner of uh, West Bridge and McGregor Street 
near what is now, um, what's the name of the mill there now? Well, it was the Coolidge Mill at this time. It later became known as the Chicopee Mill where they made the gauze. But this is a case where they tried to bring workers in to cross the picket line. And it led to this very large skirmish uh, that really um, was the absolute worst fear for police chief Michael Healy was that there might be violence and it would prompt incidents like this. And I'll tell you, this uh, was on Monday, April 9, in 1922. And there was a generous turnout, as you would say, but um, I'm looking for my notes here. Uh, this led to the real first confrontation of the strike. Uh, and I change it, the date is June 5, 1922. And when the closing hour of Coolidge resulted in the arrest of 15 strikers, and four of the United Textile Workers leaders. Um, I'm gonna read you some of the names because this will reinforce what I said about the language barriers that might've prevented strong unionism. Victoria Sishan, Mary Kowalczyk, Mary Plecki, uh, Anastasia Strzok, Victoria Krakowitz, Victoria Jakaitis, and the arrest of Victoria Sishan uh, at 50 Bridge Street at the west end of the McGregor Bridge she was arrested because police officers saw her holding a bag of sand and dropping it on the workers who were walking underneath the bridge below. So that triggered a big public protest. And so you can see that unrest is becoming a real thing in this strike. And one more slide. So again, stirring scene at the Coolidge Mill gates. You can see that um, if you look carefully at the image, this is from a book that Amoscade produced about the, the history of the strike. And you can just see the number of people. If you went between the buildings on the left, you would be crossing what, what is now the Bridge Street Bridge. So later on, there was going to be a, a protest. I'll take the next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, police officers walking along those mill gates. If you, again, if you have a sharp eye, you can recognize that is right at the corner of uh, Bridge and McGregor Street. Uh, that is Mill West in the background, which was originally known as the Flag Factory. You've probably all seen that famous flag that was made by workers in 1914. Uh, the workers were very proud of their work, but uh, not particularly proud of Amoscape at this time as we go through. And the next image. These are some of the textile worker, uh, textile worker union representatives. Uh, the most important one in the center is uh, James Starr. And as a testament to Police Chief Healy's support for Amoskeg, uh, Mr. Starr was allowed to speak in Manchester once uh, during the strike, again, nine month duration. And the United Textile Workers was forced to set up offices across the line in Massachusetts uh, because they simply did not want them fomenting uh, any kind of violence in Manchester. And the next one. Samuel Gompers uh, is in the center. I'm sure you all remember from your sociology classes that he was a, a pioneer in the labor movement here in the United States. And he was a strong supporter of Amoskeg uh, and James Starr. And next. This is a, a walk by demonstration. The workers were trying to convince Mayor George Trudell that he should take up their side. Uh, but again, he and most of the mayor, board of mayor and aldermen were firmly uh, in the pocket for Amoskeg. But you can probably recognize the Levitz building in the Amoskeg Bank on the right <clears throat> as they walk through. And there were uh, real back and forths about the numbers. Um, the union people had their own, I'll use the word propagandists, I don't mean that, I just mean PR people who would talk up their numbers. And Amoskeg certainly had its share of flax. So the question about this um, march was how many people actually took part? So reporters on the scene claimed uh, that they only counted 4,200 people. Uh, the union claimed 10,000 people went through and it became typical of the back and forth that went on as people tried to measure the success or failure of the strike going forward. Next. Amoskeg actually produced a book on the history of the Amoskeg strike. And I have it in my, on my desk right now. Uh, my particular copy, I'm proud to say, was once owned by former mayor Joseph at T. Benoit, who signed it. Um, and it was created by Amoskeg as a, again, as a sociological uh, discussion about the roots and origins of the strike and also uh, the solution that might eventually come. Now, obviously the writers from Amoskeg will come from a very particular point of view. 
Um, mine is particularly different. Um, some of you may know that I worked at the union leader for many years. Uh, and for the first part of my tenure there, um, it's called the union leader for a reason. I was actually a teamster. And we later became affiliated with the Communication Workers of America. But my sympathies tend to be much more with the workers than with management in this particular case. And I'm just making that known so you know my particular bias uh, is probably not the same as was Amos Gags. So when you look at this, <clears throat> the workers were angry for obvious reasons. They were financial and economic and they were related to working conditions. Um, but there was also a, the loss of trust was very important. I mentioned the $50 million financial loss that was incurred. But for those workers who truly believe that Amoskeg had their best interest at heart for so many years, for generations, um, this was a hard realization that when it became about money, that's all it was about. It wasn't about loyalty. It wasn't about service. It wasn't about tenure. Uh, it was about the almighty dollar. And so the disaffection that came out of the strike of 1922 is one of the most damning things that took place. Uh, how do you mend those wounds? Uh, it's impossible to do so. So you probably want to know the full ending. After the nine months, uh, Amoskeg finally capitulated on the, on the pay cut. Uh, they offered the workers that, to restore that 20% pay cut, but they insisted on the 54-hour work week. And nothing on God's green earth was going to get them to move off that point. So ultimately, in November of 1922, it was actually James Starr, the United Textile Workers uh, representative, who told the workers that this is all we can get for you. Uh, take the 20%. The fact that you'll be working six more hours means you'll be making more money than you were before, uh, which is kind of like rubbing salt in the wound. We're going to make you work more hours, but ultimately you'll make more money in the end. Um, but productivity began to resume. Amoskeg was back in business again. It didn't change uh, the fact that their business model was faltering because of Southern competition. Uh, it didn't change the fact that uh, many disaffected workers had left Manchester. And ultimately, uh, in the same way that the Treaty of Versailles ultimately led to World War II, the strike of 1922 ultimately led to a second major strike in Manchester in 1933. Amoskeg was crippled by that strike again. And the Southern competition was taking such a toll that uh, in 1935, on Christmas Eve, Amoskeg asked for um, bankruptcy protection from the federal government. And Christmas Eve was not the best time for that to take place. So you can imagine, again, the emotional devastation that accompanied that because the mills were shut down uh, from that day forward. And then three months later, in March of 1936, uh, the greatest flood ever to come roaring down the Merrimack River um, blasted Manchester into. It took out every bridge. Uh, it took out all the communications lines that connected the east and west sides of the city. And the buildings on the facade on the front of the river were filled to the second floor with mud and water and silt. The water was 17 feet over the Amoskeg Dam. And the flooding actually stretched all the way up to the lower canal. When you stand at the statue of the mill girl and you look toward the river, you'll see a white mark painted on that building. Uh, and that actually is the high water mark from that flood of 1936. So any hope Amoskeg had of reopening were destroyed and they filed for complete bankruptcy. So a city of 17,000 workers out, 17,000 people out of work is now looking at um, economic catastrophe. If the mills don't reopen, what are those 17,000 workers going to do? And what are the other people who depended upon those paychecks going to do? So if you've never been to the Mill Yard Museum, I encourage you to come because we uh, have a movie tone newsreel we show that was produced in 1937. And what it does is demonstrate what the city leaders of Manchester did to try to save the city from Amoskeg's bankruptcy. What they did is they went to the bankruptcy judge and said, uh, what can we do to stop you from auctioning off the mill yard? And it was the entire mill yard. You couldn't cherry pick buildings. You had to build a bid on the whole thing. Well, the judge said that the Amoskeg mills are worth $5 million. If you can come up with $500,000 by Friday, we won't sell, we won't put it on the block. And if you can come up with a balance of 4.5 million the following Friday, uh, you can have the entire mill yard. And they did this without ever leaving New Hampshire. These are men like um, John McLean, who was an attorney in Manchester, Mayor Arthur Moreau, uh, Jay Brody Smith from Public Service Company. And they bought the entire mill yard and then set about uh, repopulating with smaller independent businesses. They recognized that the notion of a monolithic company like Amoskeg 
was simply not a wise way to go. Uh, the monopoly was too much in danger of being toppled. So their effort uh, to bring back different industries producing mostly textiles like Pacific Mills, like Pandora Industries, uh, we just had a great exhibit on the history of that company, uh, enabled the workers here in Manchester who had those textile skills to stay here in the city and get good paying jobs and help uh, Manchester recover from what they called economic ruination. So the strike is a key factor in much of the history of Amoskeg. It was a it, you know, it was a good 100 year run, but in the end, uh, that strike of 1922 was really uh, the, the beginning of the end uh, for Amoskeg as it existed as a company. So again, the ultimate ending in November of 1922, the workers uh, go back to work with their 20% pay restored, but with a 54 hour work week. And uh, simply morale was never the same from that day forward. So that is my take on the history of the Amoskeg strike. Uh, it comes in part uh, by stories from my grandparents. My father was a Manchester police officer uh, who had been in uh, Amoskeg. He was raised at the Webster House uh, here in Manchester and they got him a job at Amoskeg when he aged out and he became a cop. Well, he and my grandmother bought a rooming house at 134 Middle Street and their tenants were all mill workers. So in 1922, my grandfather is going to work with orders from his boss, Michael Healy, uh, to stop the workers from doing fundraising walks and having what they called tag days. Uh, remember Little League, you put a little tag on your button indicating you supported. And my grandfather would have his dress blue uniform on. It would make it a point to come in with a tag on every single button. Uh, his tenants were all mill workers. And he had been an Amoskeg worker and his sympathies were with the strikers. And he was brave enough to defy his boss uh, and support the workers' side of the effort. So there's my bias. There's the root of my bias. And I open, openly confess to it. So I know that we have opportunities for chat here, and I would love to answer any questions you may have. Uh, so I don't know if uh, Bev Beverly's going to do that or Kathy's going to do it, but I'm, I'm uh, yours. Hi, hi, John. This is Bev. Um, I, I personally have a question. Uh, what was the extent of the, of the women's involvement in, 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 in working in the mills back in 1922? and also in the protest other than dropping sand from <laughs> overhead onto workers. She's my favorite, I, you know, so I had to mention Mrs. Sishan. Um, the women made up more than 50% of the MSK labor force, and many of them were independent women, uh, so it wasn't like a, a second job where they would be less likely to go on strike because if dad goes on strike, mom needs to make a paycheck. Uh, they were in it fully. And so when you look at those photographs, you'll see that um, equally men and women, the names I read of those who were arrested at that one event were uh, of the 15, I think 10 were women. Yeah. So their, their involvement was total. Their commitment was total. And yeah. as a, the notion of the mill girl, uh, you know, coming here from the farmlands of Canada, um, they were independent minded and they were willing to stand up for what they believed in. Yeah, I was just over over there. Um looking at the mill girl the other day. They need to fix those stairs. They're really hazardous, however. Um, they're crumbling, the stairs it's happen it. to her. Um, and, and that's why I asked the question because I had noticed that most of those names that you mentioned of the arrested folks, I think all of those names were female names. So I just was curious about the, the, the level of employment or if they just singled out women to arrest, but obviously they were very much there. Um, they were there and they would, you know, there were hardships that people endured. For instance, um, people were being evicted from their homes because they couldn't pay their rent. And that seems to be striking a chord with where we are today. Um, but two landowners uh, uh, donated 15 acres of land on Hooksett Road in West Manchester, in which to erect tented cities for families who've been ousted by landlords for non-payment of their rent. And the, the, the tents were provided by the union. Uh, to support the workers, but you can see by that some of the economic dislocation that was taking place for these workers. It wasn't the status quo. You know, my grandparents may have been willing to, uh, you know, let their tenants stay in place without paying rent because of their sympathies, but other landlords didn't necessarily believe in that. What about children? Um, were there child labor laws? And if if not, or if even if there were, I guess, you know, were there any children employed at that point in time in the mills? 
there were, uh, but unless you were of majority age, you could not join the union. So those uh, child laborers, many of whom were called runners or uh, sweepers, um, simply were out of work as were their adult counterparts. Uh, they didn't get any union benefits and the benefits were very meager to begin with, um, but the kids were simply put out of work. And you know, it's interesting because uh, the child labor laws were really taking shape around that time. Uh, Lewis Hine, the famous creating photographer uh, who worked for the Child Labor Council was traveling around the country photographing child labor and he came to Manchester and somehow managed to get into Amoskeg for two days with his camera. And that was no easy trick because you had to have identity cards, work cards to get through the gates. Every entrance to Amoskeg was gated. And yet somehow Hein got here and took some famous photographs of kids at work. Um, they tried to say no one younger than 12, but take for example, a family of five that comes down from uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, all their birth certificates are handwritten. And if you didn't like going to school and you were 12 years old, you could take your 15 year old sister's birth certificate, go to Amoskeg and boom, you had a job. Uh, so the system was not nearly uh, as rigid as, as it is today. But no, back in those days when the strike came, the kid, whatever kids were working, they were out of work as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, were, well, Ken, Ken is asking, were, were children no longer working in the mills in 1922? But you just, you just answered that question. Yeah, they were, they were still there. And if you think about it, um, if you've ever seen the movie Schindler's List, he talked about it like he had kids working in his munitions factories. He said, look at their hands. Their small hands can go inside a shell casing and polish it where an adult couldn't do it. In the same way, you know, kids with smaller hands, if a piece of machinery broke, they could reach inside and maybe take out the broken piece in ways that adults couldn't. So they found ways to use them uh, as laborers Again, the age thing was really hard to enforce because uh, it was a much different age in terms of uh, proving your identity and your age, which is, again, uh, a lot more sophisticated today than it was then. Yes, yes. Thank you. Now, it was both textiles and like shoes and, 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 and bags and such, right? The industry uh, yes, itself? Yes. Uh, the Shoe Workers Union was a separate entity. so. Um, while Amoskeg was out on strike, the shoe manufacturing company continued to work. And a lot of textile workers transferred over to that industry simply to get a job, especially as the strike went into its sixth and seventh month into the summer. Uh, they simply needed income. And so they moved to that. Uh, recently, uh, two professors from UNH Manchester did a great book on the history of the shoe industry in Manchester. And that's a nice counterpoint uh, to the book I have here on the history of the strike at Amoskeg. Great. Um, if anyone else, uh, uh, Mary Benson asks, could you speak more about management and the failure to change? Yeah, um, that's a great question because Amoskeg was renowned for its ability to be nimble, to turn on a dime, to recognize an opportunity. For example, when they started to realize the might of the machine shop, the foundry, they started producing materials far beyond what they needed for the mills. They produced uh, steam fire engines in the mill yard. They produced locomotives, 50 steam locomotives a year, each weighing 250 tons. Imagine the raw materials coming into the city. So Amoskeg was renowned for its ability to adapt. In 1863, for example, at, at the height of the Civil War, they were approached by the War Department. They were running out of cotton, as you could imagine, because of the blockade preventing cotton from coming here. They were asked if they could manufacture uh, weapons for the Union Army. So Amoskeg converted a couple of plants and in, in the space of two years made 27,000 Springfield rifles. And that um, ability to turn on the dime is what made the company so successful in its earlier years. But as it moved into the 20th century after the 1900s, uh, they became just more, uh, more set in their ways, more stubborn. Uh, the refusal to acknowledge uh, that in increased competition from the South was crippling for them. They simply had created a monster here and they didn't know how to make the monster smaller, more, more uh, agile, more ability to change with the opportunities. They couldn't modernize their machinery to compete with, again, those coal-driven mills in the South. 
So it was a failure of management to recognize the challenges that were coming. And I would say they're rather hand handed efforts to deal with it when they finally had to do something for economic reasons. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for John? Um, so I have a, a question really, or a comment that, you know, my, my family was involved in working in the mills for years. They came over from Ireland and they, they loved working in the mills, lived in the mill yard area. I remember my mom talking a lot about how they were well taken care of and that they really loved uh, working for Amiscake and thought that they were just wonderful. Um, but at the same time, they also had very harsh kind of working conditions. I mean, you know, they were close together and they were very